I also want to uh, recognize that the Rackleys are in their usual spot in the back row. Nice to have you guys back. Scott is home with an ailing child, but he sent me this note. Uh, actually, he sent me a note earlier this week. He said, I think I've probably been banned from coming up front and taking the microphone ever again at Redeemer. So I'm sending notes now. Maybe you can read this for me. But he said, uh, several months ago, while I was walking back from a nearby village to our home after a burial, I stepped on a rock and I twisted my ankle. He said, after trying for a few minutes to walk normally, I grabbed a Gandalf-style walking stick and I shuffled home. It was only a slight sprain, but over the next couple of days, I noticed new soreness in other parts of my body. My arms were sore from holding the stick to help my walking. My other foot was sore from having to support the additional weight from its wounded neighbor. As our journey in South Sudan and Uganda has come to an end, there were injuries. We were not able to walk without being assisted, he said. God has been gracious in his provision of others to help bear the additional weight. I want to thank the elders at Redeemer for their leadership and encouragement and support of us, the members of the church for emails and messages of encouragement and support. I especially want to thank Rick Hauck and John Dietrich, who have, in my opinion, gone beyond their role as church elders through Skype times, phone calls, driving times, meetings, and other uh, meetings with other churches, being personal counselors, and most recently marriage counselors. They've been models of Christ-like servants, and we're grateful to them. And lastly, I want to thank Harlan Bell and Paul Davidson. Toward the end of my trip home, I was empty. Like a scene out of a war movie, these two brothers came in and carried me when I couldn't walk on my own. Love you guys. Thanks to the Bell family for giving me a place to heal, to eat, to cry, to sleep, and to use the restroom. <laughs> it wouldn't be Scott if you didn't have something like that. <laughs> Thankful for this church home that loves us and supports us unconditionally. Scott for the whole family. So... Uh, that's from Scott, and we love you guys, and we're glad to have you back with us. Now the time has come. Come forward, the two of you. Liz is in, in fear. She's in deep fear for this moment, for her, uh, for her composure, but composure is not required here in this moment. Uh, tell everybody where you're headed. Uh, we're headed. It's on. We're headed to Indianapolis. No, now it's off. Now it's on. We're headed to Indianapolis. There we go. And what are you going to do there? I'm um, starting my fellowship in interventional radiology, my last year of training. Okay. At <laughs> Start the 29th grade on July 1st. And, and does this mean Indianapolis is probably your home for a long time? It's a one-year contract. So we're only guaranteed. Is that dropping out? That's weird. Okay. We're only guaranteed. We'll take the, get, hand me the other mic and we'll, uh, we'll fix this. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, a little technical difficulties. I got it. Check, check. There, that's working. One-year contract. So it's a one-year contract, and after um, our stint here, we've learned that God will bring us wherever we're going to go. So, so it could be Little Rock. It could be. <laughs> okay, just checking. That's at least a prayer possibility, <laughs> right? Yeah, and your daughter's clapping for that, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, You've been here five years. How are you different? <laughs> well, uh, <don't laughs> you have a baby. We have an addition to the family. Um, that's a hard question to answer succinctly. I guess some of the biggest changes, um, we, we've been sanctified through us. Elizabeth and I both had a habitual sin before we came here, different sins, but, but similar in some ways. And we've been sanctified from those sins um, over the time here. Um, We've uh, grown spiritually here, obviously, and um, I think we have a different outlook on life overall. Uh, oh. like, tr like I just said about jobs, uh, trusting God's sovereignty about where you're going to end up versus planning where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. Why don't you hand the mic to your wife? Yeah, I, so you knew this was coming. I knew it was coming. Yeah. I, I requested a week ago that I did not be interviewed. Yeah, well, why don't you just let Allie speak then? Hi, Allie. Say hi. Yeah, that's good. So how are you different? Well, I'm a mom. <laughs> Why don't you hold your daughter while your wife speaks? Yeah, isn't that good? No, no. <laughs> How about grandma? No, mommy is the only one who's allowed? Basically, right now. <laughs> um, I've definitely grown spiritually. Um, when I came here, I was a new believer. Boy. And... Um, I was a new believer, and I was 
immediately Hi. thrown into Bible studies and just surrounded with women of strong faith who have guided me through lots of trials. Um, probably one of the biggest trials that I faced was just my, um, my parents when they moved in. We were trying to do something good and we felt like, again, we were trying to take control of some situations that we weren't allowing God to lead us in and they failed. And my dad ended up in prison because of it. But the way this church surrounded me and loved us and just encouraged us will never be forgotten. I'm going to ask Mike Morley to come up, and um, I'm just, I'm just going to hand it to him. I'm going to let you be. You and and Terry have kind of had a special role in in uh, Carl and Liz's life, and so I'm going to let you pray for them. Okay. Let's if y'all pray along with me, please. Mm-hmm. Father God, in your kindness, you brought Carl and Liz to us five years ago. In your sovereignty, much has occurred in their lives during these days. You've brought happiness and sadness, celebration and suffering. And through all this, as they have said, you've conformed them more to the image of your son, Jesus. They came as two, and now they go out as three with dear little Allie. Lord, we pray for her salvation even now, and that in the days to come, you would conform her to the image of Jesus as you continue your work in Carl and Liz. Father, may you bless the work of their hands, Carl as husband, father, student, and doctor, and Liz as wife, mother, and homemaker. We ask that you protect their marriage as Carl's schedule will intensify, his work will increase, and his load will become heavier. Lord, as they search for a church, we ask you to direct them to a faithful body of your people who walk in truth and grace. And as they go out from us, Lord, we look forward to the day when we'll, sooner than we realize, be together again this time around your throne. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Mm -hmm. may you bless and keep them. May you make your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. We ask that you lift up your countenance upon them and that you give them peace. And we pray this all in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. 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 Love you guys. Thank you, Mike. Well, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, I want you to turn in your Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11. You guys probably have no idea how much you owe to my wife, Mary Ann. Regularly when we meet people, they will say to Mary Ann, thank you for keeping Bob in line. If it weren't for Mary Ann, I would probably be here wearing a Spurs t-shirt this morning, (laughs) preaching in my Spurs t-shirt, and we would probably be starting this series on Abraham singing Father Abraham, but she vetoed both of those options, so they are off the table. So yes, you can thank Mary Ann for that. We are starting a study this morning that will introduce us. I, I should also tell you, Curtis came up to me this morning, very sober faced. He came up, he said, I need to meet with you tonight for about three hours at (laughs) 7 o'clock. Very serious issue. Yeah, I said, I'll meet you at Buffalo Wild Wings, and we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. We are starting a study this morning that will introduce us to one of the most important, one of the most significant people in all of human history. The Bible is ultimately the story of Jesus, right? Right? But there are supporting characters in both the Old and the New Testament. And, and by the way, if you don't realize that the Bible is really all about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, we did a series about a year and a half ago that took us through the whole Bible, 66 books in 52 weeks. It's on the website. While you're jogging or while you're driving, you could listen back to that series and uh, remind yourself that Genesis is about Jesus and Exodus is about Jesus and Leviticus is about Jesus all the way through. But... Um, There are supporting characters. If you think about the New Testament, other than Jesus, who are the big names in the New Testament? Paul's one of the big names. Who else? Peter. Peter. Anybody else? Billy Graham. Is that who you said? Yeah. (laughs) When you think about the, the Old Testament, think about the Old Testament. Who are the big names in the Old Testament? Well, there's Moses, there's Abraham, there's... David. The Old Testament's got a bunch of names. You got Noah, you got Samson, you got Jonah. There are lots of characters, but probably the big three in the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, and David. 
because they play a, a, a role in continuity in the history of salvation for the nation of Israel. They are major contributors. So we're going to take this summer and we're going to spend time getting to know Abraham. And we, we could do a one Sunday message on the life of Abraham and go up at the 30,000 foot view and kind of see the big picture of Abraham's life. Or we could kind of go word by word through the text and kind of hike our way through the life of Abraham and that would take us to Christmas and beyond. But instead we're going to kind of fly at a medium pace and over the next 10 weeks we're going to look at the major episodes in the life of Abraham as we get to know him. Let me give you a little background, a little context about Abraham before we read the passage we're going to look at this morning. When we first meet Abraham in Genesis chapter 11, his name is not Abraham. It's Abram. The name Abram means the uh, father is exalted, which means this is an appropriate study for us to do on this day, right? Here it is Father's Day. We're studying Abram, whose name means father is exalted. Genesis 17 is where God changes Abram's name to Abraham. And Abraham means father of the multitudes or father of the nations. So it's a, it's a shift in Abraham's life. Abraham was born about 2100 B.C. So if we are at 2014, Abraham was about as far before Jesus as we are after Jesus. Okay? So 2100 B.C. There were 10 generations, long generations, by the way, from Noah and the flood to Abraham. And I say long generations because some of these guys live 500 years, some of them 200 years. There's a decline in years as, uh, as sin spreads. There's a decline in years among these people. Uh, but 10 generations that take you from Noah down to um, Shem, or through the line of Shem, the great, 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 great grandfather of Abraham, down through his line to Terah, who is the father of Abraham. And Terah had three sons. Terah had Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran, who is Abraham's brother, had a son, Lot, and then Haran died. And so Lot, Abraham's nephew, became Abraham's charge to take care of. All right? Terah and his three sons lived in a prominent modern city in the land of the Chaldeans. It was the, land, the city of Ur. Ur was located in modern-day Iraq near the Kuwaiti border. Most generally accepted location of Ur is a location about 14 kilometers west of Nasiriyah on the river Euphrates in southern Iraq. In fact, in fact, why don't we dim the lights, put up the maps. We'll do a little geography as we get started here this morning, okay? So here's the Persian Gulf over here. And here is Ur of the Chaldeans. It's, you see where the Tigris and Euphrates come together? Right there, there's the headwaters where they join. Those two river valleys up toward Haran, those are the known as the uh, upper arc of the Fertile Crescent that then goes down along the Mediterranean Sea. So Abram is going to follow this path from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran and then down to Shechem and Bethel in the land of Canaan. Go to the next map because this will show you a little bit different. There's Baghdad and the site of Babylon. And so you can see Ur is down here south and east of, uh, of Baghdad in this area. And what was the became the Babylonian Empire, it wasn't at the time, but then Mesopotamia up to the north where Haran was located. And then you see modern day Turkey up there and then Syria and the land of Canaan. And if we flip to one more map, this will just show you what today looks like. This is overland today. So Ur of the Chaldeans is in Iraq. Here's Iran over here. There's Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan. You can kind of see where the, uh, the journey takes Abram. Uh, Ur was a, a very advanced city in ancient times. In fact, back in the 20s and the 30s, the 1920s and the 1930s, a man named Sir Leonard Woolley led a, a team from the British Museum to the, the site where they believed Ur was, and they began the excavation. And over a uh, more than 10-year period, they excavated the ancient city of Ur, and they found libraries and temples and burial sites and weapons and houses, and they found evidence of indoor heating in some of the houses. This was a big, advanced, modern city. It was also a thoroughly pagan city. The people of Ur 
worshipped the moon god Nana. And the members of Abraham's family were participated in the worship of Nana. In fact, many of the family names have some tie to the moon. There's some, just as, as Christian parents often name their children uh, after Bible characters, Abraham's family, Terah's family, named their kids after moon things. And there's a point here that I want you to see, and I think it's an important Father's Day point. In ten generations from God's dramatic rescue and deliverance of Noah and the flood, in ten generations you have no trace of any godly spirituality left in this line, in this family. This is the same tribe, the same people who came out of Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth. And they are, they are settled here in this big city of Ur, and nobody is paying any attention to the God of their fathers. Nobody's paying any attention to the one true God. They have traded in their worship of the true God for paganism. And I think on Father's Day, we have to pause and remember that, it can, that, that our, our faith and our convictions as a family can dissipate quickly. If we are not, uh, if, if we're not careful to pass on both the precepts of God and the reality of God to the next generation, and I, I just want, I want to stop here for a second because I, I think there are there are sometimes when we kind of presume the faith of our children as as dads as fathers. They're growing up in a Christian home. We're taking them to church. We, we're homeschooling. We got them in Christian school. Whatever we're doing, we're doing devotions. We're presuming that, that being in that hothouse, they'll just catch what we got. But you need to understand there's no such thing in the Bible as second generation faith. There is no such thing. Every, every believer has to be a first generation believer. Every believer has to decide for himself, wrestle for himself, come to the convictions for himself that this is what he believes and this is what he's going to base his life on. If your kids are growing up and saying, well, I believe this because my parents believed it, that foundation is not going to be sufficient to hold them through the generations. They have to come to a point and say, this I believe because I've, I know God because I have a relationship with God, my own relationship with God, because I believe these things are true in my own life because I've experienced it. Dads, let me say that there are three important things that will help your children cultivate first-generation faith. Three things that they need from you. The first thing they need from you is a godly model. They need to be able to look at a dad and see that he's a model of faith. Now, some of you dads are going, well, then we're in trouble. Because, because I, I don't do this well. What your kids need to see is not perfection, but what they need to see is when you blow it, they need to see you confessing and repenting. Now, somebody said, somebody we interviewed on Family Life Today made a statement that I, I thought was perfect. He said, a lot of parents are training their children to be sin avoiders and sin concealers. Stay as far away from sin as you can, and if you do mess up, don't tell anybody. Certainly don't tell us because we'll punish you. He said what we need to train our kids to be is sin confessors and sin repenters. And the way we train them to be sin confessors and repenters is by showing them what confession and repentance looks like in our own lives. If your kids don't see you confessing and repenting, how, how are they going to know to do it? So you have to be a model of what a, a real relationship with God looks like. They've got to be able to see that. The second thing is you have to pass it on to them through instruction. You can't just model it. You have to be teaching them. You have to be instructing them. You have to be teaching them the Word of God. You have to be impressing it upon their hearts. You've got to be talking about it when you walk by the way, when you're on the way to school. There've got to be things that they just don't see you doing it, but they, they are engaged in it, and you're engaging them, and you're passing it on. And then the third thing that I think may be the most important thing for dads, you've got to pray like crazy for your kids. Because ultimately, that, that faith, to move from second generation to first generation faith, for them to embrace it, for it not to become a decline toward paganism, but for it to maintain and, and, and continue to be a robust faith, ultimately, that's a work of the Spirit in their lives that you have no control over. You can model and you can teach, but it ultimately takes the Spirit of God invading the life of your child and turning on the lights and drawing your child to faith. And you need to be praying that God would do that early and that God would do that in a profound and powerful way. 
Uh, what didn't happen with the descendants of Noah is that for some reason that faith handoff didn't get made. Now, I don't know if we can blame the fathers, although what's the first thing that happens when Noah gets back off the ark? Right? He gets drunk and his sons have to cover his shame and his nakedness. And I don't know that there was confession and repentance that took place after that episode. But what we, we, I don't know that we can blame the fathers, or I don't know if this was just a civilization slide, but over the course of time, here's what happened. It went from, from God's deliverance and worship of the one true God to a place where there is no remnant of the one true God left among the people. May that not be with our, the generations that follow us. Abraham is in this thoroughly pagan, thoroughgoing, he he himself is a thoroughgoing pagan. He's living in a pagan household in a pagan city away from uh, the God of his forefathers, the God that Noah and his family worshipped. And uh, he's living with his father, Terah, in Ur. And so with that as our context, let's, let's look at the passage we want to look at. We'll start in Genesis 11 verse 27, and we'll go through Genesis 12, 9. Before we read this passage, let me ask God to give us the gift of illumination so that we can hear and understand His Word. God, our helper, by Your Holy Spirit, we ask that You would open our minds, that the Scriptures, as the Scriptures are read, as Your Word is proclaimed, we may be led into Your truth and taught Your will through Jesus Christ. Amen. Genesis chapter 11, beginning at verse 27. Moses writes, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred of Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. The daughters of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah, Now Sarai was barren, and she had no child. Terah took Abram, his son-in-law, or took Abram his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, the grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, the son of Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sari, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of uh, of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negeb. Okay, that's the conclusion. May God add His blessing to our reading of this Word. There are four things I want us not to miss as we look at this passage this morning. Four things are God's call, Abram's obedience, God's promises, and Abraham's response to those promises. By the way, even though they call him Abram, I'm just going to call him Abraham throughout this, okay? Just to avoid the confusion so we don't go back and forth. Abraham is who I'll call him. First of all, let's look at the call. Genesis 11 says, Terah took his family from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran. And there's not really an explanation of why they left Ur, in, at least not in Genesis 11. It just kind of appears like an out-of-the-blue thing. Like Terah woke up one morning and said, the family's moving, everybody get your stuff together, we're, we're heading out. But we get the fuller picture when we look at three other passages from the Bible. So I'm going to ask you to turn there. The first place you need to turn is to Acts chapter 7. 
Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 recounts the sermon that Stephen preached right before he was martyred. The first Christian martyr, he was brought out to be stoned to death for his faith in Christ, and he preached a sermon. And Acts chapter 7 records the sermon. Look at verse 2 of Acts 7. Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go to the land I will show you. And he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. So Stephen tells us he fills in what Moses left out. The reason the family left Ur is because God appeared to Abraham and said, I want you to go out from your homeland, from your fathers, from your possessions, and I want you to go to a land that I'll show you. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Flip over to Hebrews 11. Abraham, of course, is listed in the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews 11. In verse 8 of Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So the writer of Hebrews is making the point that Abraham responded to the call of God by faith. One final passage back in the Old Testament, go back to Joshua. You have uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then Joshua. It's the sixth book of the Bible. Flip back to Joshua. Look at the end of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24. And in Joshua 24, beginning in the first verse, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. We just read about Shechem back in Genesis 12, didn't we? Shechem is where Abraham built the altar at the Oak of Morah. Joshua gathers the tribes of Israel to Shechem, summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and of Nahor, and they served other gods. There's the confirmation that they were pagans. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. So we get the fuller picture. Here's what's happening. In the land of Ur, God appears to Abraham and calls him to take his family. Actually, he calls him to leave his family, to take his wife, and to go to a land that he will show him. Now, we don't know how God appeared to Abraham. I wish we had the details. I wish we we knew what the the epiphany was like. I, I wish we knew whether it was an angel, whether it was a visible presence, whether it was just the voice of God appearing to Abraham. We don't know. But somehow, in the midst of this thoroughgoing pagan city, Abraham has communication with the God of the universe, who he recognizes is the one true God in the midst of his paganism. And God says, you need to get out of town. Go And Abraham says, we better go. Now, Abraham in Ur knew in his heart there was a God bigger than the moon God. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us that creation testifies to the reality that there is a big God. The heavens declare the glory of God. When you look at the heavens, you don't worship the heavens, you worship the creator of the heavens. You know when you look at, in the stars, his handiwork I see. When you look at the the moon, you know there's something bigger than the moon. There's something bigger that created all of this. Creation bears witness to the reality of God. Not only that, but our conscience bears witness. To the reality of God. So Abram, he knew that there was a God bigger than the moon God because creation spoke that to him and his conscience spoke it to him. But he was still a thoroughgoing pagan worshiping the moon God in the culture that he lived in. When God spoke to him God and God called him, something changed in Abraham's life. 
Something that had been latent became active. Something that he knew and suppressed, he no longer suppressed. That's what the call of God did for him. And, and God's call not only did that, but it radically disrupted everything about his life, didn't it? When God called Abraham, it wasn't a call to say, look, you, I'm just going to have you tweak a few things in your life. It was, we're going to change everything. We're starting a wholesale change project. Two things I want you to notice about the call to Abraham. First of all, the call to Abraham was a specific, sovereign, personal, and effective call. It was personal. It was to Abraham. God did not appear to everybody in Ur. God came to Abraham, spoke to him. It was personal. It was sovereign. God decreed what was going to happen. It was personal. That means he came specifically to Abraham and called him to respond personally. And it was an effective call. God did not come to everybody in Ur. He came to Abraham and made, ultimately made promises to Abraham. Now some of you might look at this and go, that doesn't seem really fair. That God, here are all these pagans. God comes to Abraham, singles him out and says, I want you to follow me and I'm going to do great things for you. Shouldn't God have given that same chance to everybody in Ur? Shouldn't he have sent a, a Billy Graham crusade and let everybody hear it and let everybody have a, a, a choice about whether to respond? The, but, but here's where you miss it. The real question is not, isn't that fair? or well, th That doesn't seem fair. The real question is, why did God do anything for a thoroughgoing pagan to, to bring him to awareness? It, it's not like Abraham was starting to show spiritual tendencies. It's not like Abraham was a seeker. There's nothing to indicate that. This is God, by His own sovereign choice, His own elective choice, coming to Abraham and saying, I have a plan. I'm going to work through you to carry it out. Come and follow me. If you want fair in the Bible, if you want fair, here's fair. All sin, all face judgment, all die. That's fair. Okay. So people who say, well, it's not fair that God would choose some and not choose others. The only fair thing is for God to wipe out everybody. What we have now is God being gracious. And you would say, well, why is God gracious with some and not with all? And the answer is it pleases Him to be gracious with some and not with all. And you go, but that's not fair. And at the point that you get there, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 says, time out. You're like the you're like the third grader in the, in the league who's saying to the ref, that's not fair, when the ref knows the rules better than you do, when the ref knows what's fair more than you do. Look, God can do what God wants to do, and whatever God does is fair. Whatever God does is right. Whatever God does is perfect. And rather than saying, that's not fair, the better thing to say is, I don't understand. I don't understand. But to say that's not fair is to impugn the character of God. To say I don't understand is, is to acknowledge that we don't have all the data, do we? Somebody has said, if we knew what God knows and if we see all that God sees, we'd do what God does. God knows what He's doing. And we have to recognize that His call to call Abram, His sovereign, effective, elective call, was His perfect plan. And the parts that we don't understand, we confess we don't understand it, but we trust God in the middle. God didn't call Abram because he needed him to accomplish his purposes. God could have called anybody in town. He, he could have used anybody in earth. He didn't call Abram because Abram was smarter. Didn't call Abraham because he was richer. He didn't call Abraham because er, Abraham was more earnest or was more kind or anything else. He chose Abraham because it pleased him to choose Abraham. Of course, there's a parallel between the call of God for Abraham and the call of God in anybody's life. God calls whoever it pleases Him to call. You need to know there are two kinds of call talked about in the Bible. Remember Jesus said, many are called, but few are what? Chosen. So there are two kinds of calls. Jesus gave what are called general calls. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He said, um, he said, come to me, all you who are we weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Now, is there anybody who would have come to Jesus and Jesus said, no, I didn't mean you? No. That's a general call. It's open to anybody. Anybody who responds to that call 
Jesus welcomes in. The problem is, in order to respond to that call, you need a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit to turn your heart. And that's where the effective or the effectual call comes. Because when the Bible says many are called but few are chosen, it's saying that God gives the general call, but God, for whatever purpose, only turns the switch in the lives of some. And we may say, I don't understand. And that's okay to say, I don't understand. You can say, I don't understand. But at the end of it, you have to say, but I trust. I trust that God's a good God and that his ways are perfect. God's call to Abraham is a picture of God's call to all men to be saved. Second thing I want you to see about the call of God is that God didn't give Abraham many of the details about what was ahead. He didn't say, look, follow me and let me lay out for you what's going to happen. You follow me and uh, Sarah's going to get pregnant and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. He just said, follow me to a land I'll show you. By the way, when God called you to follow Him, He didn't give you the details of what was coming up in your life either, did He? He said, follow me, trust me, I'll take you where this thing needs to go. I'll show you where to go. We have the promises of God that we can lean on, but ultimately the promises of God are only good if we trust the character of God. I mean, if, if somebody comes to you, if a used car salesman makes promises about the car you're buying, those promises are only as good as the character of the used car salesman who's making them, right? When God makes promises to us, the only reason we can trust the promises of God is because we trust the character of God. And so ultimately, that's what we have to respond in and say, God, I trust you. I believe your promises because I trust you're good, and I'll go where you go because I trust that you know what you're doing. And we're back. And when you listen to the tape, you'll never know that this happened because I will edit it out, okay? Um, no, it's all right, thanks. So ultimately, or, or why did God call Abraham to leave? Uh, leave the only city? And, and, and keep in mind what he's calling him to leave. What, what is God calling Abraham to leave? He's calling him to leave the only city he's ever lived in. The, the only people he's ever known, all his stuff, leave his family, he's really calling him to abandon everything. It's a radical call to abandonment. Leave your security, leave your safety, leave everything, follow me. And God calls us to the same thing. The decision to follow God and to trust him is not a hedge your bets decision. It's not a, I'm going to add God to my portfolio so that I can hope things will go better in my life. It is an all in, all or nothing. I'm following God. I'm trusting that he's going to take care of this, come what may. That's what we see in the life of Jesus. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. Jesus says, get rid of your money. Come follow me. Are you all in? Guy comes to Jesus and says, I'll follow you. I got to bury my father first. Jesus says, let the dead bury the, their own dead. Right? There's this all-in idea. When you find the pearl, Jesus says, what do you do to buy the pearl? Sell everything. You're all in with the pearl. Martin Luther said it in the last verse of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That's the bet you're making. That's the choice you're, you're, you're deciding on. You're saying, it's better than my stuff. It's better than my life. It's better than my family. I will follow Jesus, even if I have to leave all of that. And that's what Abram does. God calls a, called him to trust him. And he said, follow me, and uh, I will show you where you should live. 
And so Abram obeys. And we should say he kind of obeys at first. I mean, it's not a wholehearted... Well, God says, go to this land I'm going to show you. Leave your family. Well, who does Abram bring along? Terah, his dad. And does he go to Canaan? No, he goes to Haran. So you see, they follow up the, the crescent, and then they settle there. And they settle until, Her, Her, uh, until Terah dies in Haran. And, and, uh, and here's something you've got to notice. If you, if you have an ESV, look at Genesis 12, look at verse 1. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, but do you see a little, uh, do you see a footnote there? Is there a number one by your, now the Lord said? And, and the footnote says that it's probably better to say, now the Lord had said. That's what the NIV says. It's what the King James says. Now the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country. So here Moses is saying, okay, they left Ur, they went to Haran, to, to, to Haran and, and Terah dies in Haran. And then Moses said, now the Lord had said to Abraham, leave and go to the land I'll show you. Abraham had not done what the Lord said yet. He had kind of partially obeyed. And God is patient with Abraham, brings to mind in Genesis 12, you didn't really obey me, and Abram says, leaves and goes to uh, Canaan. If, if God had come to Abraham and Ur and said, come to a land I'll show you, and Abraham had said, I'll trust you, God, I'll do what you say, and then he'd stayed in Ur, would God have blessed him? Here, here's something I think we have to see. God's blessing is connected to obedience. God's promises are fulfilled in our obedience. And, and really our belief and our trust is validated by our obedience. So God comes to Abraham and says, follow me, come to the land, I'll show you. Abraham says, I trust you, Lord, I'll do what you say. And then he doesn't leave. Would you say, well, does he really believe God? Yes, I really believe God. Well, why are you staying here? Well, I believe God. Well, if you believe God, you do what he says. Now, look, we don't do that perfectly, right? Abraham didn't do it perfectly at first. In our lives, our obedience is imperfect and often partial obedience. As God, and God is patient with us in the midst of that. But we cannot think that, that God's promises are valid if our obedience, is, if, if obeying is ignored. We, we can't think we're really believing God if we're not doing what he says. That's what this story shows. Abram left with partial obedience, got to Haran, stayed there until his father died. And then God gently said, you have not really obeyed. You, you did part of it, but you haven't fully obeyed. And Abraham then packs up his possessions and the new people who are now a part of his family, and, and uh, they go to the promised land. Don't presume upon the patience of God that it will take care of you if you're disobeying God's call for you to follow Him. Don't presume upon His grace. When you recognize that your obedience is imperfect, repent and follow Him. That's what Abraham did after his father died in Haran. He went to Canaan. Okay, so the call of God, the obedience of Abraham, let's look at the promise of God in Genesis chapter 12. Here's what God says. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great so you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonors you, I will curse. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took Sari, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions, all they'd gathered. They came to Canaan. When they came to Canaan, Abraham passed through the land of the place of Shechem to the oak at Morah. The Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to him and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Verses 2 and 3 are the first declaration of what's called the Abrahamic covenant. This is God making a promise to Abraham, I'm going to do these things in your life. It's God covenanting. It's His promise to Abraham that this is going to happen. It's a unilateral, one-sided covenant that God is making here. He's not saying, If you do this, I will do this. But by the same token, there is a requirement of obedience for the covenant to be valid. God can't do what He promises unless you are responding to what God's doing. It's not that you bring anything to the covenant. It's not two parties getting together and saying, I'll put this in, you put that in, and we'll, we'll do a contract. 
This is God saying, I'll do this. And Abraham saying, okay, I'll follow you. I'm in. Don't miss the fact that in verse 2, God says, he will bless Abraham and make his name great. For what reason? I will bless you, Abraham, and make your name great so that you will be what? A blessing. What is God's purpose in blessing you? Yeah, so that you can be a blessing. It is not primarily so that you can be blessed. Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, Christ has set us free from the penalty and the curse of the law. Praise God that Christ has set us free. Then in verse 13, he says, You were called to freedom, brothers, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Why are you given freedom in Christ? So you can love and serve others. Why are you given blessings from God? So you can bless others. This is not about how you can benefit from this. It's about how God can benefit others through you, how you can be a channel of His grace, how you can receive it and dispense it to others. Notice also that the promise given to Abraham is that through him and through his offspring, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, has that promise been fulfilled? You have to ask the question, who are the offspring of Abraham, don't you? Because if you look at the physical, literal offspring of Abraham, you look at the Jewish people, and you say, through the Jewish people, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I don't know that we see that in our day. I don't know that we see that in human history, that the Jews have been a blessing to all the people on the face of the earth. I'm not trying to be anti-Semitic here. I don't think that we can say that, that the Iraqis have been a blessing to all the people of the earth. I don't think we can say the Canadians have been a blessing to all the people of the earth. But what we can say is if you look at the spiritual descendants of Abraham, if you look at Jesus Christ as the spiritual descendant of Abraham, it is through Him that all the nations of the earth have been blessed. Because as Christ has been preached in every nation, as people have come to faith in every nation, the blessing of God has been experienced in every nation. This, new, this covenant promise to Abraham is a promise, of, a promise of spiritual blessing to all who are followers of Christ. This is a messianic promise. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then notice the specific promise in verses 6 and 7. They pass through the land of Shechem to the Oak of Morah. By the way, the Oak of Morah, why that tree is such a big deal here is because the Canaanites used to come to the Oak of Morah as, a, as an oracle. They would get their soothsayers to come to the, the, the tree. It was a big tree out in Shechem. And when the wind would go through the, the leaves, the soothsayers would listen real carefully. And then they would say, here's what the wind is saying to us. So they would divine what the wind was saying as they listened to the voice of the wind through the trees. <laughs> Abraham comes to the Oak of Morah and gets a real oracle. God speaks to him. And he says, to your offspring, I will give this land. Now, if you're Abraham and you hear that promise at the tree of Morah, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? I don't have any offspring. My wife is old and barren. This is, this is not just a promise that you're going to give me land and that you're going to bless my family. It's a promise you're going to give me a family, that I'm going to have offspring. So... God's promise to Abraham, this covenant blessing, which, by the way, will be reaffirmed in Genesis 15. It'll be reaffirmed again in Genesis 22. The Abrahamic covenant will be re-ratified in those verses. But th these blessings to God, this unilateral covenant, God calling Abraham and saying, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to others, and through you, great blessing is going to come to the earth. And how does Abraham respond to that? Well, verses 7 and 8. He built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country, east of Bethel, pitched a tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. He responded to the promises of God with worship. He worshiped God. His paganism was gone. He was not worshiping Nana. Nana was, was out of sight. He had met the one true God. He responded with worship, which is how you respond to the promises and the blessings of God in your life. It's how you respond to, to wherever God takes you today and tomorrow. You don't just respond to the promises and the blessings with worship. You respond in the trials to worship, with worship. You respond in the hard times because that's the path God has you on. God says to every one of us, follow me, and I'll take you to a place I'm going to show you. 
And we don't know where that place is. It may be a hard place. When he takes you, you respond by building an altar and worshiping the Lord. That's what Job did when he went through hardship. Abraham comes to this place and he says, we're all in. We're worshiping the one and the living God. I've got to wrap this message up by taking you all the way back to the beginning of Genesis chapter 11. I want you to see something pretty... I, I, think, I think it is the overarching message of Genesis 11 and Genesis 12. You go back to the beginning of Genesis 11 and you have the story of the Tower of Babel. We talk about people who babble today. They're just people who speak on and on and they're saying nothing. Well, the Tower of Babel is that place where um, in, in what became Babylon, they were building the Tower of Babel as a tower, a ziggurat that would, uh, that would take them to the heavens. That's what you see in the story, chapter 1. It says, the whole earth had one language, the same words. The people migrated from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Now, I have to stop you here. Here's what's going on. They have come to a city out in the plains where there's no stone, and God had told them through Noah, He said, I want you to, to scatter, and I want you to multiply, and I want you to fill the earth. Okay, so these people come to the plains, and instead of scattering and filling the earth, they say, let's just huddle up and make a big city here. Let's just all stay together. We'll make a big city. It'll be a great city. It'll be an advanced city. They didn't have stone. They said, but you know what? We're so technologically advanced, we can make our own stone. We'll make our own brick. And we, we don't have... We don't have mortar, but we can make our own mortar. And they, they become this technological city, and they say, we got this great thing. And here's what happens. This technologically advanced city, they're all living together, and they're starting to think, we're pretty hot stuff. So they said, let's make a skyscraper, a big, tall building that will take us all the way up to the heavens so that we can go up and see where God is. Here's what they were saying at the Tower of Babel. We're so technically advanced, we're going to build a tower so that we can go up to where God is and either visit Him anytime we choose or maybe displace Him. That's what the whole thing of the Tower of Babel is. And Moses loves, that's what, look at verse 4. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth, lest we do what God told us to do. Let's just do this. Moses uses irony in verse 5 when he says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. It's like, you can't build a tower tall enough, right? The Lord had to come down and say, let me see your little city. <laughs> Here's a contrast I want you to see. The beginning of Genesis 11, these people said, We're going to build a tower. We're going to build ourselves a way to get to God. We're so technologically advanced, we're so smart, we know better than God. We're going to stay here in this city, we'll build a tower to get to God. And what does God do? He destroys the tower, scatters their languages. And then in Genesis 12, now you go back to Genesis 12, 2 and 3, and God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. The same thing that the people were trying to do with their own achievement in Genesis 11, God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to give it to you. Why? Because Abraham did anything? Because Abraham built a tower? Because Abraham made his own brick? No, because God was gracious. Look, I think the overall message here is that when we in Genesis 11 say, we're going to try to please God through human achievement, God scatters us. He knocks down our towers. And he destroys it. But when we respond to the call of God, God says, I'm going to give you what you wanted in the first place. I'm going to give you the blessing that you were trying to build your way up there. You can't get to God through human achievement. You can't build a tower to God. You have to walk across the bridge that God has already built. God built a bridge through the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. When He stretched out His arms, He created that bridge that's, that takes man separated from God and reunites him. There's no tower that'll get you there, but there is a bridge that will get you to God, and it's the bridge of Christ. And I think the calling of Abraham is God very loud and clear saying, what the people tried to do with their own strength in Ur, 
I'm going to sovereignly accomplish through Abraham and through his lineage, and that's where the blessing is going to come from. You don't try. We, we just sang it when we sang in uh, Solid Rock. Um, all other ground is sinking sand. His his oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my foes give way, he then is all my hope and stay. That's where we stand, not on our own achievements, but on what Christ has done. It's why we come to the end of the service every week and we come to the table to remind ourselves that the death and burial and resurrection of Christ is our only hope. It's where our faith is and it's what our trust is in. And so this morning, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I want you to, to just pull back and think about the call of God in your own life. Uh, have you heard the call? Have you responded to the call? Have you responded with obedience? Is it partial obedience? Or is it wholehearted obedience? Are you testing the patience of God? And, and if you have responded to that call, are, are you responding with worship as you come forward to receive these elements and saying, this is all my hope? That's what communion's all about. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, Rather than coming and receiving the bread and the cup, it would be better to stop and consider your relationship with God. Have you responded to the call of God in your life? The, the Bible says that it, this is a family meal and that communion should not be done lightly. It should be done by those who are wholly committed to the work of Christ in their life. And so this morning I would invite those of you who are visitors, those of you who are regulars who know and love Christ, come down the outer aisles, receive the bread and the cup, take them back through the center aisle to your seats. We'll take the elements together here in just a minute. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, then let's talk about the call of God and, and whether He is calling you today to trust Him and to be all in. I'd love to talk to you about that after the service this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of Abraham. Thank you for his life. Thank you for uh, what, what you speak to us through his life. And I ask that you would, uh, as we come and receive these elements, that you would minister to our own hearts. That, that your promises are true, that you can be trusted, and that we can rest in you. I pray in your name. Amen.
Jesus used bread and wine as signposts for his disciples at the last meal. As they were celebrating the Passover, he took the bread. After he had broken it, blessed it and broken it, he passed it. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you receive this, remember me. So, Lord, this morning we remember what you've done for us. We remember that in you all the nations of the earth are blessed that the covenant that you made to Abraham was fulfilled when Christ was crucified. And so we receive this bread with grateful hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was over, Jesus took the cup, having blessed it, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you receive it, remember me. And so again, Lord, this morning we remember your shed blood. We remember that the covenant that you made with Abraham was, was ratified in a new covenant through the blood of Christ. And so we receive this cup with grateful hearts. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing that last verse of more love to thee. Then shall my late, latest breath whisper thy praise. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. Christ. 
gracious unto you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord give you peace and favor as you go. Amen. You are dismissed.